Well, we're launching this new project. Yes. In which we're going to be trying to talk about the three readings uh, for each Sunday service among those churches that follow a lectionary. Uh, maybe we need to explain what a lectionary is to start with. What's your impression of a lectionary? Well, from my understanding, every Sunday there are chosen readings that are chosen for a church to so that the church over the course of three years can read the Bible almost in its entirety. And they're chosen from the Old Testament, from the New Testament epistles, and also from the Gospels. Each year, this year now, we're starting with Schedule A, which we would be discussing the books, the Gospel book of Matthew. Then we would discuss the next year, we would discuss the book of Luke, and then the following year, the book of John. I don't know who the magic people are that... Uh, choose the lectionary, but I know that there are lots of different churches that follow it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that probably takes us beyond what we want to get involved yeah. mm -hmm. in. Yeah, just know that we have certain readings that we're going to read every Sunday. They're always different, and they follow a certain pattern. Right. I, and they start with the season of Advent, which is the beginning of the Christian calendar, mm -hmm. and then proceed all the way through the different seasons of the Christian church year. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is the first Sunday in Advent. Um, what's your understanding of Advent? I think a lot of people have different ideas about what Advent is. Well, I when I was little, I understood that Advent talked about the coming of the Lord, the coming of the birth of Christ. Um, now in my later years, I think that most churches celebrate that Advent begins the first day of Christmas and we start singing Christmas songs the day after Thanksgiving. Um, however, I think the, the, um, the spiritual understanding is that it is the coming of the babe, but not only that, the coming of of Jesus again. Of the Lord, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the word Advent is from a Latin word that means arrival or, or coming and so when you, if we use Advent season productively, mm -hmm. it can remind us of a lot of arrivals of Jesus. You know, not only when he came as a baby in Bethlehem, but also when he came um, as the King of Kings on Palm Sunday, lowly, riding on a donkey, coming to do what he, his whole life was aiming for, and that was to, to die on a cross on Good Friday. But he also keeps coming in other ways. He comes in the sacrament of the altar. He gives us his body and his blood, so he's coming. And then also he comes to me anytime I open up the scriptures and he speaks me, to me through his word. And, and he also comes to me through other Christians uh, when uh, they represent Christ's love to me and I need it. Uh, so there's just a whole bunch of comings that we can be stimulated to think of during the season of Advent as you listen to these scripture texts that are being read. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that, that I think has been lost over time as we have embraced Christmas being a sentimental, romantic, happy period when this baby, this sweet little baby is going to be born and everything is rosy and everything is wonderful. The readings of Advent and the hymns of Advent are very reminiscent to hymns of Lent. The tone is somber that, that this baby is coming, but this baby isn't coming for necessarily a happy life. The baby is coming and will live a life that will be fraught with danger. And the colors, as I understand, of Lent uh, in some churches are the same colors of Advent. The color purple for, for, um, for passion is the same color that's used in some churches for Advent, that there's always an overtone of of the shadow of the cross is mm. over Advent as well as a lot of other things. And I know that some churches have switched to a kind of a royal blue mm -hmm. to maybe emphasize the royal identity of Jesus coming, mm -hmm. that even though he was born humbly in a manger, that he is still King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but he is, during his earthly existence before his resurrection, he's in a state of humiliation so that he has emptied himself of his divine powers and prerogatives and only from time to time takes them back to do miracles or to reveal his full divine glory like on the Mount of Transfiguration. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I imagine it depends upon which emphasis you're going to focus on during mm-hmm. Advent. Uh, but both of them are there in mm-hmm. um, Lutheran churches. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, w- w- let's take a look at the first um, t- text, which is the Old Testament uh, prophet of Isaiah, mm-hmm. chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. Um, it seems to me that that connects very ne- nicely to the other two texts that are going to be read on the first Sunday in Advent, which talks about um, how everybody's going to be gathered to Mount Zion, uh, to the house of the Lord, and that uh, toward the end of that, uh, it pictures a time when swords will be beat into plowshares. And in other words, weapons for warfare and conflict are going to be changed into domestic tools, and then spears are going to be changed into pruning hooks. Uh, and this is a wonderful picture of the culmination of history when Jesus comes back to set up Judgment Day and to set up a time where there will be no more wars, no more death, no more diseases, no more conflict as he gathers all, everybody around his throne of grace. Um, but I know there are other people who see this as a picture of everybody coming to Mount Zion, which is another name for Jerusalem. And so there are some people who see this as fulfilled in the beginning of the state of Israel in 1948, and that that has already started to be fulfilled um, in our own history here. But when you look at everything else that it's describing, people haven't beaten their swords into plowshares during Mm. this time. No. And so that's got to be a picture of the future Mm -hmm. when Jesus comes back. It seems, and you have to correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that the, that the verbs, when I read them in the English translation, is that it is an intentional act that someone will take their, their sword and will turn it into something else. Um, that it, it isn't forced upon them, but it is a choice of people to choose peace. And that may be another reminder mm-hmm. that these texts are not just localized or uh, fulfilled in one time period because that is what happens to a Christian when a Christian comes to faith in Christ is that you start listening to what he says and he says don't slaughter your enemies he says love your enemies Mm -hmm. and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you Mm -hmm. instead of trying to avenge yourself on them Mm -hmm. and so I think what you're pointing to is is a very good possibility that what Isaiah is picturing is not only the end of time and life in heaven where there will be no more wars and weapons and so forth but also even now there's a change of perspective of the person when they become a Christian. That when we make that choice we can bring God's kingdom to this earth as we pray in the Lord's Prayer. In little bits. In little tiny bits that we can can create an environment around us where we choose not to engage as the world wants to but we choose to follow Jesus. That's it's right. not, and while Jesus during his time spoke to specific groups of people who were engaged with Roman occupation, um, they can be timeless truths, but they're not just timeless truths. That if we look back at the historical places where they happened, we can under, we can gain a deeper understanding of what Jesus was talking about to apply it to our own. Can we give up? Our, our swords? Can we give up our guns? Can mm-hmm. we give up all the machines of war that we have right now? Uh, it's, it, it takes thoughtful conversation mm-hmm. to, to answer that question. And we live in a complicated fallen world. Yes, we do. And so some of the ideals that we have may have to be tempered by mm-hmm. wisdom, protection of other people, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. yeah. But despite the fact that we live in this fallen world, um, Jesus chose to come that's anyway. right. That's right. And that's mm-hmm. what we have is a picture of that coming back mm-hmm. to bring that kind of perspective, not only in our personal lives, but also at the end of all history. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, if you look at the next text, the epistle text in Romans chapter 13, verses 11 to 14, here it seems to be saying <laughs> that day is coming when he's going to set up a whole new world order um, after Judgment Day, but be ready. And it's nearer than what you may think. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if Paul wrote this in the first century, and it's now the 21st century, 
uh, it's taken a while for that to happen. Mm -hmm. But every generation of Christians that I know of has believed that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime, mm -hmm. just as we believe that. And so we live in a state of readiness. Yeah. And um, do you see anything else in that text that you think is something people can kind of glom on to as they listen to this in their churches? Well, when I, when I look at that, that you should be ready, I think of the eighth month of pregnancy. Okay. You've got your bed ready, you got the room ready, you bought some diapers, you've got your bag packed, but that baby can come early, that baby can come late, you just got to be ready. Okay. And there's a certain tension, of course, that exists because if you're working a full-time job, your employer wants to know, well, when's that baby coming? Well, I don't know. And you, but you, there's a, there's that, there's that tension, you, a preparedness, but yet a not fulfillment because you're just waiting. Okay. And that's, I think, what we all live in is that state of, well, I'm not going to stop living mm -hmm. because Jesus isn't here yet, but man, he better, I better not be. Better and, not. and that seems to be reinforced by what he ends with when he says, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and, and don't get uh, sucked in by all the um, gr desires of the flesh. That The woman who knows that she's going to be having a baby any time mm -hmm. is not going to go out and uh, do some crazy things. You're not going to get too far away from your doctor. No. And mm -hmm. similarly here, he's urging us, uh, if we're to be clothed with Christ, and this is the same Paul who wrote the letter to the Galatians, I think he's reminding us also to keep the gospel as the center focus and priority of our lives. Mm -hmm. Because he says in Galatians, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. And so the best way I can be ready for the coming of Jesus is to have the gospel soaked into me so that I know I will be acceptable to Jesus when he comes back. Not because of how ready I am, not because of how much I'm doing for the church or how much I'm reading my Bible. It's because of what he has done for me. Mm -hmm. And so my readiness is really dependent upon what he has already done for me. Mm -hmm. And the gospel see, keeps reassuring me of that. I think what Paul is here urging us to do as we listen to these words from Romans 13 is uh, keep the gospel in your consciousness. Mm -hmm. And don't get sucked into thinking that you're going to be acceptable to God because of something you're doing or your lifestyle or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he's writing to a church in Rome. Yeah. Rome. Yeah. The, the pinnacle of, of debauchery and cruelty and power and yeah. wealth. Yeah. That you don't rely on that because mm -hmm. you've been clothed with something else. Yeah. You've exactly. been chosen for something else. Right. Don't lose sight of that. Don't, and don't lose hope. Don't lose hope and don't lose heart. And the, the gospel then connects to with these two readings mm -hmm. by, again, reinforcing the message of being ready because uh, mm -hmm. you don't know when the final uh, return of Christ is going to occur. Mm -hmm. And so in Matthew 24, uh, Jesus keeps urging his disciples, uh, you don't know the hour. In fact, not even the Son of Man knows the hour. And that's obviously a reference to himself. And that has caused some people some really great concern because how could Jesus, who in Matthew 25 is pictured as being on the throne on Judgment Day, not know when that day is going to happen? Mm -hmm. And it takes us back to understanding that during his earthly existence, he was in a state of humiliation where he emptied himself consciously of his divine powers and his divine abilities unless he wanted to retrieve them for a particular purpose or miracle and so he can honestly say during this time I am not aware of when the end of the world is but when I'm exalted after my resurrection you better believe I'm going to know when it is mm -hmm. and we don't know when it is and so we have to constantly live our lives ready for it to happen even today mm -hmm. yeah. but we also can't let it consume us that's right that we can't live our lives wondering when it is, planning when it is, we just have to be ready and give up give up that knowledge, give up the pursuit of that knowledge because somehow what, it's going to bring us security to know that we're going to die tomorrow? Or do we just live today to the fullest yeah. and honor God in everything we do? 
And the image that he uses in the middle of that text about one being in the field and one taken, the other one left, and a woman grinding grain with a friend, and, and one is taken, one is left, it is a reminder that not everybody uh, is going to make it to heaven and that there will be those who are left. And you ask yourself, well, what did they do that made them part of the though the unprivileged, that they can't be chosen. And it doesn't have anything to do with what they've done. It's whether they have received what Christ has done. And so it's a constant reminder, again, to be ready for his return, not by doing something or by offering something, but by receiving the, the big something, and that is his grace, his love, his mercy. And if you're rooted in that, then the Holy Spirit has his own way of growing fruits of faith out of that, mm -hmm. uh, almost effortlessly. Yeah. So, so those three texts kind of fit together pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they all have a thread connecting them. And um, that, that should be a, an interesting thing for people to look for mm -hmm. as they listen to these three texts yeah. in their church services. And see how they're imitated perhaps in the next couple of weeks. We have, yeah. we have four weeks of Advent. So we have texts that are based on the similar theme, and we'll see how they play out as we approach the birth of Jesus. And maybe the other question people can ask themselves as they listen to the text over the next four weeks is, which coming of Christ is being emphasized in this text? Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen the coming of Christ at the end of all history, but we've also seen that there are references that could be inferred from these texts referring to his coming into our lives too, mm -hmm. through baptism and, and other ways. And so it'll be interesting to see, okay, how many different nuances of Advent do the scripture readings portray for us in the next four weeks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be kind of fun. Mm -hmm.